Hi, welcome to this video series on, series on the introduction of Network as Code to our CTO advisor audience. I have with me Ned Valavance. Ned is going to introduce himself in a sec, but I wanted to preview the series. Video one, we're going to do an introduction to Network as Code. Basic concepts, what is networking, Network as Code, how is that related to Infrastructure as Code, what are some of the benefits, what problem are we trying to solve? Video two, we're gonna talk about implementing network as code. We're gonna dive into some of the tools, technologies, infrastructure as code, a little bit more configuration management with network as code. Then the third video, we're gonna do advanced topics, talking through network test and validation, network monitoring and analytics with network as code, and then finally security and compliance with network as code. Ned, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. Uh, hi, I'm Ned Bellavance uh, from nedinthecloud.com. I've been working in IT for over 20 years now, and a large portion of that has been with data center and cloud technologies. And it was probably about a decade ago that I really started working with infrastructure as code, which I think is, you know, important to this conversation as we talk about network as code, because it borrows a lot of the same concepts and terminology. So before we get into network as code, I love that you preference this with infrastructure as code. Let's define the two. What is infrastructure as code? It's simply the process of defining your infrastructure, your architecture, using some type of code, some sort of machine readable language. Uh, rather than clicking around in a UI, um, you're using either imperative commands at the command line that you have all scripted out, or you could use a more declarative approach and then have something interpret your configuration or your code and make it so in whatever the target environment is. But it does require that whatever infrastructure you're provisioning is able to be interacted with programmatically, uh, especially over uh, some sort of API, uh, a REST-based API. So I think the most popular version of this, we're going to give the cloud most popular version of this, which is AWS Cloud Formations. I can take, you know, uh, some code, some JSON, and, and say what I want to build and deploy that in AWS consistency, consistently. However, if I don't use AWS or I want to do this on-prem or across cloud, the more popular platform is probably, I think the most popular platform is safe to say is Terraform at this point. It's certainly the one that I've come to know and enjoy quite a lot. And I actually got my start with Terraform because I had some frustrations with CloudFormation. That was my first real introduction to using infrastructure as code on AWS. And there were a lot of shortcomings in the way that you could build out a cloud formation template and do things like make it reusable across multiple environments or create multiple instances of the same thing. And it just didn't have good constructs for that. It wasn't really a programming language, per se. It was more of a configuration file. And so I discovered Terraform in that process and then quickly realized that Terraform could work across not just AWS, but all the other different public cloud providers and really anything that you write a provider for, it can interact with. So it became very popular with me, but it's just a good implementation of some of the key concepts that make up any infrastructure as code product. And it brings the same benefits that any of those other products would. And we typically see these tools in movements or operating models such as DevOps. Uh, SREs use these to build or manage systems at scale. So these are the uh, tools that, is, you know, you're not buying DevOps when you buy a infrastructure as code solution, but it's a tool that uh, and a methodology that we use to implement DevOps types of uh, operating models, correct? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the real thing is to take a step back and go, what is the benefit to the business of me introducing something like inf infrastructure's code into the environment? How is that making things better for the stakeholders? And armed with that, you got to figure out what are the things we're trying to do? Are we trying to make our environment more stable? Are we trying to automate the provisioning of environments so that we can test out new features? 
once you know kind of what the end goal is, now you can select the tooling and solutions that allow you to actualize that benefit. And infrastructure as code is often one of those things where before every environment was manually provisioned, your developments didn't match your staging, didn't match your production. When you tried to do a code progression from those environments, something that worked perfectly in staging now breaks in production because of an infrastructure problem. So in that case, you're trying to solve for consistency because consistency allows you to accelerate your software development, which then in turn hopefully helps you sell more widgets or gain more customers or <laughs> whatever it is the business is actually focused on. And the most simplest, you know, form of this type of benefit is when we talk about fat fingering the configuration, <laughs> when we have to build the same, you know, I'm a Windows admin, so I have to think about this in the Windows context is uh, when we build a Windows server, the two different people will build it differently. Uh, the same image, even if they're taking it from an image file, they may build a server differently than uh, any given time. Not just two different people, the same person. I may not build this server the same way I built it yesterday or the next day. I may have uh, uh, found new practices, new best practices to build a server. And infrastructure as code is the most simplest uh, construct is a way to be consistent and for me to track how I change building servers, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you're not talking about code repositories and all these other abstracted benefits of infrastructure as code, it's just a really great practice. And I think it's just, it's the accepted norm now. It's the consistency, it's the reusability. And I'll be honest, Keith, in the same document, I will spell the same word three different ways because <laughs> sometimes I just do that. I'm inconsistent. I'm a human being. And if that's the way you're building servers, then yeah, you're going to have three differently configured servers. If that's the way you're provisioning your network environment, you're going to have four different network switches that should all be basically identical but you've accidentally configured them slightly different in a way that might not be immediately obvious, but six months down the line ends up breaking something on your network. So being able to apply that consistency and rigor to your infrastructure just makes it that much more robust. So would it be safe to say that network is cold is a subset of infrastructure is cold? I think that would be a fair approximation. And networking brings its own challenges with it, uh, right? Because that was not traditionally the approach to configuring network gear. The traditional approach was, I'm going to connect into each switch and each router, and I'm going to run a series of commands against it. And I had all kinds of hacks back in the day. I had a Excel spreadsheet that would have the commands in it. And then I would merge the commands into like a big body and dump that out to a text file and then copy and paste it, right? Like there were ways to automate the, your networking configuration, <laughs> but it was it was very, you know, duct tape and spit together. It was not uh, a, a cohesive thing and it wasn't something that you could easily transfer to someone else to take over management. It was, everything was very bespoke. And I think network automation and network as code, the idea is to get away from that, but you still need to interact with these network devices uh, in the traditional way because a lot of them don't have an API front end that you can make rest calls against, right? They're, they're expecting you to connect, connect via SSH and start issuing commands. And that's not how a lot of the infrastructure as code products work. So you need something in the middle that does some kind of interpretation of the way that infrastructure as code wants to work versus the way that the device wants to work. So let's talk about network automation a little bit, you know, we know the disadvantages of manually configuring the network. It is, you know, we, we introduce uh, authentication, centralized authentication into network switches. So we know who logged into a switch. We may not necessarily know who changed the configuration of a switch or what configuration changes were made. We can't, you know, revert back to a known good state because what's a known good state of 1800 different switches. Like mm -hmm. we don't know that there's, there's no centralized management of it. There's been tools in the back in the past that's kind of helped us do configuration management, 
but not in a uh, way that's, uh, in my opinion, that's moved the needle. So let's talk about some of the benefits of automation and some of the motivations you've seen for people to automate the network specifically. I mean, one of the, the primary motivations is just removing that manual aspect of going to each switch and pushing a configuration to it, then going to the next one. That's fine when you're a small, medium business and you've got 20 switches in your environment. When you've got 100 switches or 500 switches in your environment, all of which need to be configured in very specific ways to work with each other, uh, that that becomes untenable for the manual uh, process. The other portion of automation is you usually do introduce some sort of control plane. And that control plane has a holistic view of your networking environment that no one switch or router has. So that has the additional benefit of being able to see what is the possible impact of a change that I'm proposing to the environment before that change is applied because it has that more holistic view. And typically, uh, because you're managing things in code, or at least the automation platform is, a rollback actually is possible because it is aware of what the previous version of the code looked like. And if something goes wrong, it can move move back to that previous version of the code and apply it through some sort of out of band management to those network devices. So I think the biggest benefits of automation is removing that manual process, making things consistent, uh, making rollback possible and being able to preview the changes or the impact of your changes prior to them actually being applied. All right, Ned, thanks a lot for helping me dissect the introduction of Network as Code from a concept perspective. In the second video, we're going to talk about implementing Network as Code. And then in the third video, we're going to talk about advanced topics in Network and Code. That's going to be the meaty one. So if you, you, you think you already have a handle on the industry and, and the concepts, go, you can go ahead and skip on to that. But I guarantee you, you're going to enjoy the second video in the series.